Today, Amanda Lyons, who's a physical therapist and clinical leader on our multi-specialty unit, is going to share some clinical expertise related to thriving with a prosthesis. Uh, her presentation will be followed by Sportables Community Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator, Josh Sloan, um, who will share information and some success stories of individuals with limb loss engaging in adaptive sports and recreation opportunities through Sportable. So good morning. My name is Amanda Lyons. Like Allison said, um, I've been a PT for about 11 years. Um, <clears throat> I've worked both inpatient and outpatient. Um, I've been able to serve the amputee community um, in both, uh, both settings, um, mainly in inpatient, helping people um, shape their limb and get their limb ready um, for a prosthetic, and then an outpatient helping people learn how to walk with their prosthesis. Um, so I have a lot of experience with that. So um, at, like Allison said at the end, feel free to ask whatever questions you may have. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about are K levels. K levels are important um, just to understand uh, the process behind getting different components to um, your prosthetic. K levels were established by Medicare in 1995 as a means to quantify the need of the potential benefit of a prosthetic device for patients after a lower limb amputation. Um, the rating system is still used today by Medicare and Medicaid and many other insurances to justify uh, different components uh, to your prosthetic, like I said. The good news is, is that your K-level can change. As you continue to progress and as you continue to be able to accept new challenges, um, your K-level can go up and you can uh, qualify for different components to your prosthetic. The main way that we determine your K-level is through an outcome measure called the amputee mobility predictor. Um, it is done here in inpatient and also will be done in outpatient and the scores will be sent to your insurance company um, and they, uh, based on your score, it gives you a K level and that's how we determine it. We're also not only in communication with your insurance company about your K level, but also your prosthetist. So as you see here, these are the different K levels. It goes from zero to four. Um, zero is an individual who would need a prosthetic just for transfers. Uh, they don't really have any um, ability to be able to walk. A K1 would be a household ambulator, meaning someone who would just be able to walk around the house and not really in the community. In the community, they would be uh, benefit more from using a wheelchair. A K2 uh, is a limited community ambulator, meaning they're getting out and about, but not really doing a whole lot of uneven terrain. They're mainly just uh, walking from point A to point B. And a K3 is someone who is accepting more challenges. Uh, they're more of an advanced community ambulator, meaning they're able to transverse most environments. Um, they have uh, different needs for their prosthetic from an exercise standpoint. And a K4 level is someone who you would think of as like an elite athlete, um, you know, someone who's kind of participating in Paralympics or marathons or um, triathlons or those types of things. And, um, you know, Josh could probably give us later on a little bit more insight into individuals that he's helped or worked with in Sportable that are K at the K4 level and probably also at the K3 level. Um, So these are the different um, components to a prosthetic. A lot of times um, you hear about the word prosthetic, but you're not really sure um, what it all entails. And again, the, you'll continue to hear about these different things from your prosthetist and also from your therapist. So it's good just to have, to hear the verbiage and to have an initial understanding of these different components. As you see here, this is a socket. Um, the one on the left is for someone who has an above the knee amputation. And the one on the right is for an individual who has a below the knee amputation. 
The socket is created when the prosthetist takes a cast of your residual limb. So this is typically done about four months after the initial amputation, once the residual limb has had time to heal and has had time to shape and um, you've had some time to get all the edema out and it has shrunk a significant amount. The socket is the device that is situated between the residual limb and the rest of the prosthesis. It is highly specialized, like I said, to each individual's needs because it's an actual cast of your leg. Um, it is used, like I said, both for people who have above the knee and below the knee amputations. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about are the different knee components. Again, knee components are only appropriate for people who have above the knee amputations. Um, and then there's different components that are justifiable, like I said, based on your K level. So K1, uh, like I said, are individuals who are mo mostly just household ambulators. They would have the most simple type of knee. Uh, they would have a most likely a single axis knee and a constant friction knee. Um, it would, typically has a manual lock feature, meaning that the uh, individual will have to lock it on their own. Um, and again, it's one that's just used for very basic walking. You can see a picture of it. It's the picture on the top. The K2, this is someone who's a little bit more of a community ambulator, someone who's be, gonna be going out and about. Um, they most likely will have a multi-axis knee. And uh, again, it's gonna be constant friction. Um, it has an extension as, assist and um, assist during stance, and it also helps with flexion. Um, so it's a little bit more high level. As you can see in the bottom picture, there's a little bit more to it than the top picture. So then we get into the, the more fun knees. So K3 and K4, they would be appropriate for both of these types of knees. The first um, one is a little bit more simplified. It's a hydraulic or pneumatic knee. Um, hydraulic means it, there's fluid within it that helps to control it and pneumatic means that there's air. They allow for various walking speeds and also walking on uneven terrain. They're also uh, pretty good with um, stair negotiation so they can give you a little bit of support when you're going up the stairs and when you're going down the stairs. And then the most specialized type of knee is a microprocessor knee where there's actual sensors within it that help uh, to be able to assist when you're walking. It can detect different velocities and accelerations during your walking um, and help to normalize uh, your walking pattern a little bit. It allows for ease when navigating stairs and un uneven terrain. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, with the like the K1 through four uh, classification system, how heavily is that based on the kind of amputation somebody has versus other factors, I guess? Like, cause I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to, so I think I, like, I know a lot of folks that, I mean, I think that I have two friends that have like the microprocessor, like knee and are both above the knee singular leg amputees, but I don't know why they would be K3 or K4 versus K1 or K2, if that makes sense. Yeah, so Josh's question was, how do you kind of determine uh, based on an individual's unique presentation, what level that they are? So again, that's going to be kind of populated from um, the amputee, uh, the AMPRO, the outcome measure. And a lot of times it's based on their activity level. So someone who's a K3 and K4 are going to be people who are really active. Um, they want to be involved in a lot of recreational things, whether that's hiking or biking or running. Um, and then some people who are K1 and K2 usually have a lot of comorbidities. They have a lot of other stuff going on that really kind of limit their, their walking ability and their ability to be out in the community. Um, but okay. again, it doesn't mean if someone's a K2, they're a K2 for their entire life. They can definitely progress, but... right. But it's way more based on like, like it's not based 
on like the specific type of amputation you might have. It's way more, much more based on like your lifestyle or like uh, health or whatever generally. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm glad I asked because I didn't. Okay, cool. Sorry. Nope. Good question. All right, so the pylon is that little metal shaft between the, um, so for people who have above the knee amputations and they have that knee components, it's between the knee component and the foot. Um, for people who have below the knee amputations, it's between the socket and the foot. Um, so basically the only purpose of it is to help with the length of the leg and it allows for shock absorption. So the next part we're going to talk about uh, are, is the final part of the prosthetic leg, and that's the foot. Again, the foot components are based on K levels, um, and this is appropriate for people who have above the knee and below the knee amputations. The most basic type of foot is a sock foot or sack foot. I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong, um, and that's a K1. Um, a K2 is a single axis foot and a flexible keel. Um, a K3 is one that's a little bit more dynamic. It has multiple axes, so not just um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, it has inversion and eversion to allow for uh, transversing on different types of terrain. Um, and then a K4 uh, is very similar to a K3 and all the things I said above, but a K4 is also uh, someone would be appropriate for a flex foot or a cheetah foot. Um, I know that you guys have seen people using those in the Paralympics, and those are mainly for, for just running and sprinting, the main purpose of them. I know individuals use those also whenever they do um, triathlons and for the, obviously the running portion of the triathlon. <laughs> Another thing that's really important to have a good concept of as far as uh, using your prosthetic are prosthetic socks. So prosthetic socks, they come in different ply is the term, and they come in a one ply, a three ply, and a five ply. A one ply is the thinnest and a five, five ply is the thickest. And the picture to the right, there's a, that's a picture of a three ply, so it's the one in the middle. It's used to accommodate for shrinking of the residual limb. Um, and it may, you may have a different number of ply of sock in the morning compared to the afternoon. So usually when people wake up in the morning, they're a little bit more swollen. So they may need a one ply. And then as they're walking for eight hours or whatever during the day, um, the residual limbs usually will shrink a little bit. And by the end of the day, they may need five ply or six ply. Um, it's a very common thing. So I always tell individuals that it's important to keep uh, different size socks with you um, because you may need to, to put them on throughout the day. They're worn between the gel liner, which is right up against the skin and the socket. If when you're um, using your prosthetic, if you ever come to a point in time when you need more than 10 ply, then that's usually a good indication that you probably should go see your prosthetist because uh, they're probably gonna have to uh, cast you and fit you for a new socket because your residual limb has shrunk so much um, that it's no longer fitting appropriately. So some, just some basic prosthetic troubleshooting. Um, whenever I have individuals who would come to me on an outpatient basis, there are a lot of things that I had to kind of keep an eye out for to know, um, is this something that I can fix on my own and give them advice on from a therapy standpoint, or is this something that's more mechanical that the prosthetist is gonna have to look at and have to adjust in their actual prosthetic? Um, so in my opinion, it's really important to make a appointment with your prosthetic if there's pain. Um, and pain, you may have little aches and pains as you get used to wearing your prosthetic, but if it's painful for a long period of time over multiple days, then it's probably not fitting right and you should probably see your prosthetic, prosthetist, I mean. 
So some things to look out for if that would happen uh, if you're wearing too many ply socks, if you uh, if it's too bulky, if you have too many in there, or your residual limb is swollen. Um, your residual limb will throb and feel like it's constantly constricted. Uh, it will there will be an uncomfortable pressure. Typically, this pressure you'll feel uh, if you're too swollen, you'll feel it more at the top of your residual limb, where your residual limb is resting at the top of the um, socket that you'll start to develop um, a red purple color at the end of your residual limb and there may actually be some weeping. Um, this is a result of the residual limb not making good contact and what it does is it almost uh, creates almost like a like a hickey type of, <laughs> I mean that's the best term I can use, um, discoloration um, because there's not, uh, you're restricting the circulation down to that area. Um, you will also feel like your prosthetic is too, is too tall. Um, that's probably the most common feeling that uh, individuals will report to me on an outpatient basis. And they're like, ah, oh, it just feels too tall. Like, I don't feel like I'm even. Um, and a lot of times, again, that would be from uh, the residual limb being swollen or they're wearing too many ply socks. So what types of things can make your residual limb swollen? Uh, one of the most common things, and it's a very easy thing to correct, is that you are taking in too much salt. Uh, so um, I had a, a woman come to me on an outpatient one time, and she was carrying her prosthetic, and she said, I just can't seem to get it on. So we kind of talked through what she did the previous day, and she mentioned that she ate a large bag of um, chips. And I said, oh, that's probably why you're so swollen and it's not fitting. Um, so then she made a few adjustments to her diet and uh, then it fit much better. Again, that's a very easy uh, solution. Uh, the other one is that uh, the, the individual is not wearing the shrinker at night. So it's really important to wear your shrinker at night to make sure that your residual limb stays a nice consistent shape and size um, from day to day. A more serious uh, reason that you would swell would be an infection. If for some reason you got a cut or your um, incision uh, opened and some sort of infection was created, um, you would see swelling. And then other types of medical conditions, most commonly um, a heart condition, kidney impaired circulation or uncontrolled diabetes. Um, if you suspect that there's potentially something going on and you're having multiple days of increased swelling and you've considered your salt intake and you're wearing your shrinker and it's still swollen, then I would definitely make an appointment with your doctor because there's probably something bigger going on. So some different things about not wearing enough socks or enough ply. Um, the prosthetic would move too much. That's the basic thing you're gonna see is that um, your foot would turn from the socket not fitting appropriately, the foot would look like it's too turned in or sometimes too turned out. It would just be really loose and wanna turn. Um, the, prosthet the prosthesis might feel really um, tight on the bottom. You feel like you're dropping too deep in. And if you're dropping too deep in and having too much pressure at the bottom of uh, the prosthesis, then you could have rubbing and some skin breakdown could result. Uh, the other thing that you could feel is the opposite of what I mentioned before that the prosthetic is too short. Just some different things to take into account of when it would be a potentially a good time to have your prosthetic replaced. Um, your weight. Uh, a lot of times, this is not tip, typically common, but if you lose too much weight or you gain too much weight and it's just not fitting appropriately, um, that would be a good time to replace it. Uh, obviously, if the components are no longer working appropriately, if uh, you'll see this most commonly uh, in the knee components, your activity level is no longer appropriate for your prosthetic. And again, that's maybe when you're gonna be going up a K level. Um, so there would be time to get a new prosthetic at that point. Um, and again, like if, if it's just not fitting well, um, a lot of times what will happen 
as you're wearing it. Uh, you get that initial prosthetic within four to six months after your surgery, and then you're wearing it for a while and your limb continues to shrink and shrink and shrink. And then, you know, you have a conversation with your prosthetist and you're like, okay, it's now time for your more permanent prosthetic. Um, and that would be a good time to get a new one as well. So different ways to stay connected. Um, we're partners with the Amputee Coalition. Um, if you go to their website, it is a phenomenal website with a lot of really great resources. With a lot of really great resources. Um, so I really, really encourage everyone to take a look at that. They have peer mentors. They have a ton, a huge library of educational resources. Um, and again, as you can see there, there's their mission. Um, it's just a really great way to stay connected, to get information, um, and to um, really advocate for yourself. We also are really excited to announce that we have a local support group. Um, it is a joint support group between our inpatient friends here and our outpatient friends with Sheltering Arms. Uh, the support group is the first Wednesday of every month from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, as of right now, we're still doing a Zoom calls for that. Uh, and for more information into RSVP, if you would like to attend, there is an email that you, Sarah Davis, you can email her. Her email is listed right there. Um, but again, we're really excited about this and we're really happy that we can serve the community in this way. Does anyone have any questions? I think we can uh, try to unmute the participants and see if we can answer any questions you have. Um, how do you choose your prosthesis in terms of insurance? The question is, how do you choose your prosthesis in terms of insurance? That's going to be based on the K level. What will happen is your therapist will determine your K level. Um, from the outcome measure, the amputee predictor outcome measure. Um, and then you'll have a conversation with your prosthetist and it's their job to run it through insurance to see what you qualify for. Um, there are based, uh, like I said, there are many different companies that create these different uh, components. So they can give you a lot of insight into the specifics of the different components. But like what I went over today is just kind of the general understanding of, you know, what's a microprocessor knee versus what's a hydraulic knee. Um, so I hope that answers your question. All right, thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Josh, it was, this was fun. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>